five minutes for rebuttal? Yes, please, Your Honor. Okay, we're ready whenever you are. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, and may it please the court. My name is Eric Mayer, and I represent Uni Haskell, who is the appellant and the former wife uh, in the underlying case. And this is actually the third time I've had the privilege of appearing before a panel of this court uh, on an appeal stemming from this underlying divorce action. Uh, a panel of this court previously affirmed the final judgment of dissolution. And another panel of this court previously affirmed the trial court's February 2018 order enforcing the final judgment. And both the final judgment and the February 2018 enforcement order um, relate to this particular appeal and will come up again. Um, what we're appealing is the trial court September 2nd, 2020 order on the former wife's motion for attorney's fees and costs. And we've raised in our brief uh, two distinct issues relating to that order. And unless the court prefers otherwise, I'm going to start with the first issue. The first issue is that, well, the former wife contends that the, the judge lore erred when she determined that she could not or, or would not consider the cost and fees that the former wife incurred in connection with or, or as part of the uh, appraisal of the PCP group membership units that were subject to equitable distribution. So in the equitable distribution, she was to be given 50% of the units, right? Correct, Your Honor. So, and then she ultimately decided to sell those units and hired an appraiser to appraise the value of them so that she could dispose of them. Is that fair? I, I, think, I think it requires more explanation that, that I'm, I'm happy to provide right now. So, so in the final- but I guess, I'll let you explain in a second, but let me home to my point so sure, you can, sure. can take it into consideration. If the equitable dis distribution provided her with units, what does the expense of an ultimate sale have to do with her right to recover those fees? In other words, all she got were these units. That was the property right she got in the settlement. The fact they were subsequently disposed of and she sought an appraisal to determine the amount. How does she recover the cost of an appraisal in that scenario? The reason is this, Your Honor. Um, so at the trial, there, there was no question that that the former husband would continue to operate and keep um, the business. At that time, however, and as the trial court recognized during the trial, um, there were contingencies that unrelated to the divorce case that made it uh, impossible for an appraisal of the shares. So while the trial court wanted to give uh, all of all of the shares to the former husband and give a fair fair value price to the former wife that couldn't happen because there was no way to appraise them at that particular time so what happened what the trial court said okay what we're going to have to do is split them in half and then she gave the former husband a right that he wouldn't otherwise have um, she said if and when, or in the event, I'm not sure of the exact wording, that the former wife ever wants to sell these shares, she has to give the former husband the right of first refusal. And Mr. So that Mayor, was a to, right he wouldn't follow, otherwise have. I'm sorry. To, to follow up on Judge Morris's question, because I I, I think you, you said the words that maybe that are, that are troubling to me and possibly also to Judge Morris, if and when, it, she decides to sell them or in the event she decides to sell them. So, so it was contemplated that at some point she may sell them, but there was no order that she sell them. It, it was completely left to her discretion, right? Uh, no, Your Honor. It, at that point, right. But what happened was that um, 
the former husband defied the, the final judgment and didn't provide the shares. And instead, he purported to uh, transfer some shares to somebody else at an artificially low price. And that is when the February, that, that's when the motion to enforce the final judgment was heard by the trial court leading to the February 2018 enforcement order. And in that order, the court did uh, require the former wife to sell, to offer the shares to the former husband to sell, to, to sell, offer to sell them to the former husband, or if he declined, then to the company. But, but that, that was a new imposition on the former wife that she now had to sell the shares, but the court recognized that she couldn't do that unless she had an independent appraisal because the problem that got us to that point was twofold. Number one, the former husband didn't give her the shares. He sold them instead. And number two, he sold them at an artificially low price, which was either exactly or virtually exactly the same price that he had advanced for the value at trial. And that the trial court said, no, that I'm not accepting that these shares cannot be valued now. So yes, in the February, 2018 order, uh, ultimately the former wife was ordered to offer those shares to the former husband. And the only way she could have been able to do that in a fair manner to effectuate what the judge wanted to do all along, which was to give her fair, fair value and to have the former husband end up with the shares, was that she couldn't get an independent appraisal. So it is not as if, and, and when Judge Morris was asking, well, so, you know. Mr. Long, wanna... can I, can I, can yes. I interject? Let, let me Please. see if I, as I understand the record and correct me if I'm wrong, that in this case, the court basically decided not to award the cost of performing and completing that business appraiser because the court basically came to the conclusion, I don't have the authority, I don't have the, the, the subject matter to award this. And, and, and isn't the key here that the actual, the, 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 the performance of that business appraiser is really not necessary to enforce any of your client's rights that is awarded in the final judgment. Am I correct? And it circles back to Judge Morris's case question and Judge Joachim's question that in this case, she received, she was awarded these units in the final judgment. And so the issue of completing a business appraiser does not really go into any matters of enforcing any of those rights that is awarded in the final judgment. Am I, am I reading this incorrectly? Am I wrong? Well, I don't want to, I don't like to use the word wrong, Your Honor, but I, but I respectfully, I, I want to give you my interpretation, which is different. And then after I do that, I want to uh, make a quick point about subject matter jurisdiction versus continuing jurisdiction at the risk of, of, of giving you uh, Pellucci fatigue, because I know you've heard, <laughs> heard, heard it earlier. So, <laughs> so, so had the former husband done what he was ordered to do in the first place and just given her the shares, the case would be over and the, she would either sell them to him at some point when the, 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 the value was ascertainable. But what his sham sale and, and uh, violation of the order made the court realize is that she, she changed it. She actually made, she actually required the former wife to sell. So it wasn't it wasn't as if she just said, you have these shares, do whatever you want with them. And she said, okay, well, I want to appraise them. And we're saying, okay, she wants to appraise them. We want, to, we want someone to pay for that. It's not, it's not that she's, it's not a right that, that she's trying to get somebody to pay for, for her own enjoyment of the property. It's, it's a right. Um, the appraisal was recognized by the trial court to be necessary to, enable her to um, find the fair value of the shares because 
if the trial court didn't do that, then it certainly would not be equitable for the trial court to have ordered her to sell them and to give the former husband the right of first refusal that he didn't he doesn't otherwise have. There's no nothing in the operating agreement would 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 give him that right. But the court wanted to make sure that these marital units could stay intact and and ultimately give the former wife the ability to get fair value for them. It couldn't happen at trial because they the appraisal uh, wasn't possible. Um, so it was contemplated that it would happen sometime after trial when, when the former wife had the shares, but the former husband refused and, and didn't to follow the order. So ultimately, for some reason in the enforcement order in February, 2018, the trial court said, okay, now you have to provide the share. I'm transferring the shares to the former wife. I'm not, I'm not going to wait around for the husband to, to, um, to follow my directions. I'm transfer, I'm effecting a transfer. I'm giving the former husband a right of first refusal. I'm saying that his right is triggered now and that she needs to offer them to for sale to him. And in connection with that requirement, she can appraise them. So her appraisal, the appraisal itself was necessary to enforce the scheme that the trial judge had, had put in place in the first place, which was with an objective to get the former husband the opportunity to have all of the shares, but the former wife the opportunity to get fair value for them. And the problem, when, Mr. Mayor, with all yes, this sir. is that we have to interpolate a lot of things to come to that conclusion that you've come to. In other words, the, the, what this overall scheme and plan has never been written anywhere. All we have basically is a final judgment awarding her 50% of these shares. And after that, she can do whatever she wants to with them. She can sit tight and wait for her 50 50% of the net proceeds of the business, should the board of directors declare a distribution, or she can sell the shares, which she elected to do. That's the difficulty with all that. That's the problem we're facing. We just have a judgment that says she gets the shares. It yes. doesn't have all of this context that you have provided us because it's just nowhere in the judgment. Well, Your Honor, you, you, don't, have to, you don't have to follow me because what... You just need to look at the enforcement order because the enforcement order doesn't doesn't say, OK, now she has the shares. She can do whatever she wants with them. She can wait for a distribution. She, she can do what she wants, as you suggested. It said she has to provide them for sale to the former husband. And it said to to facilitate her ability to do that. Well, I thought it was a right of first refusal. Before she sells them to somebody else, she's got to, you know, offer them to him. In the original final judgment, it was a right of first refusal without any requirement that she sell it. In the in the February 2018 order, she said the judge said that she, the former wife, has to now sell them. That that she's deeming the right of first refusal to be triggered, and so. She no longer has he no longer has simply a right of first refusal pursuant to the February 2018 order. He now has the right uh, to require and, and she has the requirement to immediately uh, or as soon as practicable or as soon as an appraisal is done, provide those. So no longer did she have the right to sit tight and wait and see. And may, maybe I'll just enjoy receiving distributions, although, you know, that that would be very hypothetical in the context of this company, but, but she, she was required to do that. So, and, and in order to facilitate that requirement, she had the ability uh, to do an appraisal. And what I wanted to say quickly about subject matter versus continuing jurisdiction is that, is that this is clearly an issue. It, to the extent it's one of those, it's continuing jurisdiction and not subject or matter jurisdiction. And, and the reason that I think the distinction is important in this case is because um, the, the, the appellee in, in his brief and, and at the hearing repeatedly 
labeled it subject matter jurisdiction and, and suggested that that is going to allow him to collaterally attack the February 2018 order. But uh, the fact is, it's an issue of at most continuing jurisdiction, and you and that would not allow you to collaterally attack an order based on a continuing jurisdiction. Mr. Mayor, You're I'm not so sure about... Hang on just a second. You're at 15 minutes, Mr. Mayor, just so you know. Uh, thank you. It's your time. You can rebuttal. use it however you want. Oh, well, I'll wait. I just ask a quick question. Can I, if, can I, I want to talk about issue two. Do I, can I talk about that on rebuttal or, or do I need to talk about that now? You can, it, it, it's your call. But I won't be foreclosed if, if the um, opposing counsel doesn't mention issue two. Well, she can't jump up and make an objection. So, you know, okay. <laughs> you can say whatever I, I'd you like want. To reserve, <laughs> I'd like to reserve the remainder of my time, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. You'll have four and a half minutes left. That was a long question I asked. I understand. It was. <laughs> Ms. Lopez? May, it's please all you. May it please the court. Lindsay Lopez on behalf of the appellee, John Haskell. And um, we're asking the court to affirm the fee order because we believe the trial court properly found it didn't have jurisdiction to alter the property rights by giving the uh, former wife, Uni Haskell, the right to have the appraisal paid for in this instance. And I, I think probably the best place to do is to just jump right into uh, where we left off, which is Ms. the- Ms. Lopez, before you, before you jump right in, let me jump in. It, Cause it seems to me that the trial court's order is really uh, legally inconsistent. The only way that the trial court, as I see it, could have granted the former wife the right to an appraisal is if that was part of the enforcement of um, one of the, you know, the, the final judgment. In that sense, it would be a continuation of the dissolution proceeding. So if the trial court had the authority to order, to, to give her the right to the appraisal, which I think the trial court below found, you, um, and I, I know I'm referring to the trial court in general, and I apologize for that, most recently, the trial court found that previously there was the authority to permit the to to order to grant the right to the appraisal. There was just no authority to grant the to to pay for the appraisal. Aren't they sort of inseparable? Because if they're all part of the dissolution, we argued that they were inseparable at the hearing. Yeah. We argued that the the court shouldn't didn't have the authority to grant the appraisal and certainly didn't have the authority to grant the fees on the appraisal. We filed a notice of cross appeal on that and we ultimately decided it's not an issue we wanted to pursue on cross appeal. But I will say that in answer to your question, I think at the time that the final judgment was entered, the property rights were settled. She gave Uni 50% of the, um, of the shares and those property rights were settled. Thereafter, there were disputes about it. Those disputes um, really related largely to what was required by operating agreement and whether the deemed offer to sell had been triggered by the operating agreement. And so I heard Mr. Mayor's um, contention that, that John didn't follow the um, court's order. We laid out some of the ba factual background in our brief. It's not really important for the issue today, but I just wanted to address it to say the, the issue that came up was whether or not once the shares, uh, immediately upon the shares being um, distributed to UNI, whether that triggered the deemed offer to sell. And we have always contended that it did, but that that was not an issue for the family court. At that point, those are just, they are creditor and debtor issues there. They're the issues that you get when you become a shareholder in the company and that those are issues to be resolved later. And it's pretty clear if you look at um, Judge Williams at the, there's a lot of hearing dates here, December's 2017 hearing as she goes through the process. And when she says, okay, well, I'm gonna enforce this because I really meant, you need to transfer them to her. You don't need to, this shouldn't be you offering them to someone else. But I am finding now the divorce should finally be over. To the extent that you guys want to fight about what these rights mean going forward, these seem like issues that will be, these may be issues we can fight about for years and years in the civil court. But I'm finding that the divorce here should now be done. And that's consistent with case law, you know, this many cases from this district, the Bridges case, the Jennings case, the Mason case, all of those cases that hold, the court has very limited jurisdiction after the um, final judgment of dissolution. At that point, the property rights are settled. 
and the parties behave as creditor and debtor as to each other. If they, if they have, believe that there is a problem going forward, they can file a new suit. She can file a suit related to um, her rights as a shareholder, but that's not an issue that remains in the family court and remains under the need and ability to pay analysis where forever after all disputes they have related to this company are on John's dime and he has to pay for you know in, any disputes that they have. At that point, their property rights have been settled and if she wants to take it up in a subsequent suit, that's more appropriately handled in the civil court. And I think this case is um, fairly similar to the Jennings case from this court. And that and is- Ms. Lopez, let me, let me interrupt you. Let me play devil's advocate. If there was an issue with the husband turning over those units to the wife, certainly the court will have would have continuing jurisdiction to handle that, right? Absolutely, Your Honor. And that's why, although we disagree that there was um, a problem with what happened after the distribution order, we didn't contest the fees associated with the enforcement order. So there were certain things we didn't contest the appellate fees. We didn't contest the fees that were still remaining related to the enforcement order, but things related to issues related to the how to divide up the company later, we said those are not appropriate. The, the court doesn't have jurisdiction to award those fees. Okay. So in your position is anything outside of the actual distribution of the units would have gone beyond the, the final judgment? Yes, but I will say, you know, we didn't, we didn't file, uh, pursue the cross appeal. And to the extent that the court right. determines that the uh, appraisal rights were part of the enforcement, which we would contend that they're not, but to the extent that the court says, okay, well, we do still find that the appraisal night rights were necessary to enforcement. We didn't appeal the, the fees related to the four orders that were entered on that, but we do think that it's a substantive property right to, to give her additional, I mean, she's seeking $120,000 of additional fees for completing the appraisal. That's a big dollar. It's not just a, a tag on amount. That's sort of fundamentally changes the uh, property distribution that was between the parties. And we would say that's not the sort of thing that the uh, trial court had the jurisdiction to do post-judgment. I would say this case is very similar to the Jennings case in which the parties, the, the court entered a final judgment of dissolution that actually in that case did the same thing. It divided the company 50-50 between the two of them. And then they entered into unlike the situation, a number of other agreements, and one of which the court, you know, incorporated, <laughs> as we're talking about some of these continuing jurisdiction issues, the court incorporated it, and then they continue to have disagreements about how to handle the company and how to divide it up. Ultimately, they said the apparently exasperated trial court um, just said, okay, well, I'm just going to appoint a special master. You guys can't figure it out. I'm just going to appoint a special master. They'll sell the company and divide it up. And this court said, that's not something you can do. We understand why you wanted to do it. We understand, but at this point, after you've divided up the company interests, the remedies are outside the family court. There's, there's no continuing jurisdiction with, that, with respect to that. And then I just wanted to touch briefly on the second point um, in the appeal, unless anybody has any questions about the first point. The second point is uh, a question about the amount of the fees awarded. I just wanted to emphasize that this is an area where the trial court has broad discretion. The trial court is required, uh, it shouldn't be reversed absent a clear abuse of discretion. And this, this court has set out a framework in the Tulos case that says you start with the lodestar. So you start with the reasonable hours times the reasonable hourly rate. And then at that, after that, you need to make detailed specific findings regarding need and ability to pay. And then if you make any adjustments based on any of the Rosen factors, you need to make specific findings on that. In this case, Judge Laura followed exactly that process. She made very specific findings as to the fees that she was awarding um, as to four, as to four or the hours that she found reasonable for the attorneys and paralegals in connection with four specific motions. She made specific findings about the reasonable hourly rate and then she said, I'm ordering 100% of the reasonable fees. She didn't make any adjustments. She made findings about need and ability to pay. And so there's no basis in the record for finding that she abused her discretion in that regard. Just look over my notes. And I'd just like to, to also state for that point, this is a situation where the trial court didn't adopt either parties, um, the numbers that either of the parties argued. This isn't a case where 
uh, John came forward and, and made a proposal and she just rubber stamped what he asked for. She went through what were some very detailed affidavits, about 200 pages of affidavits and made specific findings of the hours that she found were reasonable with respect to those. Um, she heard the arguments, she received the evidence, she reviewed expert testimony, uh, affidavits, and she made very specific detailed findings. This is exactly the types of findings that the Perez case and that the Bogos case and that the Rogers case and that the Tulos case say are, are required in the sticker circumstance. So we would ask the courts to affirm the fee award. Unless Thank the court has any other questions. We oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> are you through? Unless the court has any other questions, we'll rest on our briefs. Okay. Thank you very much. I thought you were winding up. I don't mean to cut you off. No, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, you have four and a half minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to make one point on the first issue, and I want to then address the second issue. But first, I, Judge uh, Rothstein Yoakum ha had a question that she, she didn't ask as, as my time was running out uh, before my, I hit my rebuttal time. I don't know if she still has that question. No. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So the point I want to make regarding the first issue is it. The, the difference between this and the Jennings case is crucial because in the Jennings case was an appeal of the judgment um, uh, ordering the sale. This is a collateral attack on the February 2018 enforcement order that became final when this court um, issued its mandate after um, affirming. Um, now, issue two. Ms. Lopez brings up. Um, Tulos. The Tulos case, uh, the second DCA actually reversed the trial court's um, fee award because it only provided a portion of the fees that the recipient asked for and made no findings as to why uh, the other portion weren't awarded. And that's the same thing that happened in Rogers versus Rogers, which we cited in our briefs, Roe versus Rodriguez Schmidt. In those cases, the trial court ordered only a portion of the fees sought, and the trial court awarded the, the portion without, without making findings to support the denial of the other portion. And the second DCA reversed in both cases, uh, saying the exact same thing. If a trial court determines that there is an entitlement to attorney's fees, it must also set forth findings regarding the factors that justify the specific amount awarded. The court here awarded fees regarding four specific motions. And, and those are set forth very clearly in her order. Um, but there, 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 as we indicated in, in our reply, uh, or listed in our reply, there, there was a lot of other litigation uh, relating to this case uh, that go beyond those four. And the trial court provided no explanation whatsoever as to why we didn't get fees relating to, um, among other things, the former husband's multiple motions to stay the proceeding while uh, his petition for writ of certiorari was pending, uh, litigation and hearings on various discovery motions, litigation regarding the entitlement to fees and costs before the parties ultimately stipulated to entitlement, um, disqualification issues stemming from the fact that the same attorney was represent both uh, the former husband and the company, and various issues, including dueling summary judgment motions on the former husband's civil action for declaratory relief, which was consolidated into the divorce case and inextricably intertwined with it. So there is no explanation whatsoever as to why uh, the, the trial court denied, denied all of the fees relating to, to anything other than these four particular motions. And even with respect to these four motions, um, the trial court didn't award all of the fees that, that were related to those four motions, and there's no explanation whatsoever. Um, now, as to whether the reason, whether she thought she could only uh, reserve, she could only or, um, order fees on, on where there had been a specific reservation, um, that, that would be an, an error because that's inconsistent with rule 61.16. And also, uh, as we cited, the case, uh, the third DCA case, Rohrer versus Oregon, as we cited in our brief, which very clearly states that in a family law case, um, the normal civil rule doesn't apply. And, you know, post-decretal motions uh, for fees uh, for, 
relating to post decretal um, activity can be aggregated essentially. It, it, you can ask for those fees and 61.16 says from time to time, the court may award them including during enforcement and modification proceedings. So, um, but we don't know if that was a reasoning or not because the trial court didn't explain why she limited um, the fee award to those four issues, putting aside what, what's encompassed by my Mr. issue. Mary, one. you're out of time. Just Thank so you, Your Honor. I ask that the, um, uh, the order be reversed and remanded. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Thank you both very much. You did a nice job here today. Okay. Thank you. Our next case is.